sit here. So the, the theme of the paper is the implication of the survival of religious freedom in Nigeria. Uh, my colleague has, uh, the first presenter has actually done a lot, a lot of justice with regards to the explanation of how the nature uh, of Nigeria as a country. But suffice it to say that the, this country is a very big country with up to 220 million people. That's equals up to 80% of the whole of East African countries. Just imagine that. And since my the first presenter has said a lot about Nigeria, so I will simply speak to this paper because of want of time and because we have many slides in this paper. So uh, the first to reckon with in this particular introductory part of the past that in 1914, the colonial master by name Lord Lugard, Fred Lord Lugard, uh, actually amalgamated the northern and southern protectorates of Nigeria. And without taking cognizance of the facts of what Edward has said, that the communal complaint of a society with its incompatible cultural, religious, and ethnic uh, values will continue to be a plausible background for our inquiry because, because of this multi ethnic, multi religious, multi cultural um, sh uh, shifts of this particular country, it's over time has made us not to continue to live uh, in peace and incompatible with one another. Uh, they, this is a program for incompatible religious, social, cultural, political, and ethnic alliances and affiliations. It says a lot about this particular uh, uh, aspect of what you want to project in this particular bit, uh, uh, paper. It is the writer's quest to determine the extent the respect of religious freedom has been tolerated and as well undermined in Nigeria, and to see pathways towards restoring the peace as the bit of a continuously conflict prone nation. We're going to look, examine this abuse of freedom of religion with all these documents, universal declaration of human rights, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also see some inconsistency and also incongruity with the, the conclusions of what we find in the Holy Quran and, of course, in Sharia law, with the, the, uh, the, that are preaches tolerance and peace. But in reality, what we see is uh, the opposite of what they preach because of the, the quest to impose Sharia law in Nigeria. And uh, that is a major concern of this paper as well. So look at the historical background of the Nigerian nation. Since our independence, there are a lot of social, cultural, economic, political, and religious challenges up to today. Nigeria, for 70% of its historical history, has been ruled by the military. And of course, even the present president of Nigeria, Bugari, was once a, a military uh, president who's now a, a civilian president, a military disguise. And uh, Nigerian political history has been littered with cues and counter cues, needless of delivering those cues and counter cues. Uh, with the successive governments that have come and go in Nigeria, the grievances and animosity flowing from the unmet economic and political. Politically non negotiable needs of the people still persist of the southern destruction of Nigeria. Uh, for the most part of Nigerian political history, the Hausa Fulani have held up the 70% of the leadership position of Nigeria until date. The, the, those who are living in the northern destruction of Nigeria. It's interesting to know that Hausa Fulani are mainly Muslims, where the Yorubas and Igbos who occupy the southern uh, part of Nigeria are mainly Christians. So we are going to look at where the human rights and facts were enshrined in all the documents we are going to examine the human, the universal declaration of the human rights. And we say that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And, and these are the many shapes of the human rights we are talking about right to life, right to freedom of expression, and so on and so forth. And now uh, we see in Article 38 of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it states on the position of human rights and its respect. These are 
for want of time, we're going to skip the unnecessary and then focus on the next necessary aspect of this presentation. You can get the rest of the slides, which I believe will be shared to you. So we are looking at now at the Christian notion of religious freedom from the Second Vatican Council document on the Gnitatis Humane and of his Pope John Paul II's one day of his uh, statement that religious freedom therefore constitutes the very heart of of human rights. Its inviolability should therefore be questioned. So we are the next track in this paper is the Muslim notion of religious freedom, the Sharia law connection. The summary of what we want to see here is the fact that most Islam has been predicated on salam, which means peace. But now and again, we see some religious um, instances of religious intolerance. Uh, in the country, and it the first to impose Sharia law contradicts its own agenda, basic agenda. So I want to look at this uh, man's and nine, 1996 uh, emphasis with regards to the choice of being a Muslim. He was saying that it's something that's volitional. It's not something that's 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 it's a free religion. As if you wouldn't want to be a Muslim, you are free to be a Muslim. But unfortunately, if you become a Muslim without practicing what Muslim believes, then they have good, you might even be killed in the process. So that's posed as a serious uh, concern. So in a male dominated religion, religion such as Islam, women are not to be, to be seen not covering their full face. This is also one of the challenges of Islamic uh, is, is Islamic agenda. And they are not allowed to participate in major social, political, and religious discussions of Islam in some Islamic states. Women are not allowed to perform some social responsibilities like driving car and, and, and so on. This is another instance of a repressive anger and bitterness. This religious ideologies can have in the psychosocial lives of some Muslims, especially their women. Mapping out some of the consequences of radical Islamism in Nigeria. In this tract, we want to see some of those consequences of this radical Islamism, the examples, instances of them. And we've talked about the, the quest of imposition and expansion of Sharia law and the, that stands in contradiction to, to what the constitution of Nigeria, Nigeria represents. And B, we are going to look at the, the the religious-based violence and instability that are currently aff afflicting Nigeria. Thank you so much. Uh, and in many ways, like in the uh, uh, Boko Haram, you all know, bombings and so on and so forth, and the bombing of churches that has even something that is common now in Nigerian setting. And nearly every religion is affected by this. Look at some pictures that can show what you're talking about. In the church, and then C of, of, of four is a lot has been written on the motivations and activities of the ferocious terrorist group called Boko Haram in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Needless to whatever the obvious, and they have this jihadist agenda. And the, the, the great, the lesser and greater jihad, of course, in spite of whatever they're proposing, is something contrary to what our Christian beliefs uh, uh, postulate. You see. She had its agenda with its intense of uh, gruesome and graphic uh, images of killings we've just seen. The okay, let us just go straight to to okay. B talks about Nigerian position emphasis on the issue of uh, being free and fair and without marginalization of any group, but we still see this layout. The E part of uh, four is the leader, leader uh, all these grievances and animosities have actually fueled the secessionist movement of independent people of Biafra, headed by Mazen Nambekan, who was abducted in Kenya sometime last year, and then put in Nigerian custody of uh, just he was just released just last week, with, with of course with some conditions. Case studies of South African countries with protected religious conflict, which have Central African Republic, Mali, Somalia, and, and the list can go on. But the 
According to uh, Matthias Bassedal, saying that what we call relative deprivation theory, when a particular group is over time deprived, marginalized, and excluded, of course, they will begin to um, show some animosity and signs of violence. The last before the conclusion is the way forward. There are a lot of way forward, of course, improvement of democ the democracy, which mitigates religious violence, should be emphasized in Nigeria. Um, in order for justice, equity, and fair play, which constitute the very essence of the Nigerian constitution to be truly implemented in Nigeria, the principle of distributive justice should be called to mind. Uh, at first, the emphasis on getting to the roots, the family, yeah, should also be emphasized. The issue of the respect of women's rights should remember the case of uh, Chibok Gang's abduction of 2014 is still lingering in our consciousness in, 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 in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to know that women's rights are also human rights and should not be abused and they should not be treated, inhumanely treated and they should not be ascribed some with these traditional stereotypes that are negative, neg stereotypes rules that are negative in, in, in excess. Let us just jump to the conclusion. The, the conclusion. Both the documents you have just seen here in this paper made allusion to the right to change one's religion and the right to refrain from professing or practicing one's religious beliefs. Uh, the Quran and the Sharia laws writings and teachings which constitute to encourage, which continue to encourage to hide these movements, death penalty to an apostate, limited legal rights of the members of those religions recognized by Sharia law, like Christianity in an Islamic state and the hostile life of a non-Muslim in an Islamic state is deeply troubling. What is also more troubling is the quest to impose and expand the Sharia law in a federal and constitutional state like Nigeria. And finally, the consequence of ingrained hatred and animosity that we have sown in an incompatibly multi ethnic groups of people is still being exacerbated with religious violence. What follows in this precarious situation of survival was the resurgence of the repressed and persistent grievances that caused the Nigerian Biafran civil war with the modern version seen in the present secessionist agenda of the IPOP movement. Finally, governments of the Federal Republic of Nigeria should always bear in mind that for lasting peace and stability to return to Nigeria, they should play the by the democratic rules of ensuring that justice, equity, fairness, which is incidentally is the very essence of the Nigerian constitution. This is the last slide, please. And I want to just read this. When the state begins to help the family, for instance, to nurture from the early stage of the individual development growth, those core and inalienable values of respect for human rights and freedom of religion or belief, then, then it will be hoped that the society will thrive and survive in an environment that will pull these fundamental human rights. The future of such states will be bright since such states will continue to appreciate and value the respect of human rights with all that concerns women as well, rejects hostile and irrational Islamic religious teachings and movements, uphold the principle of distributive justice, abhors marginalization, and the exclusion of a group of people over another group in the distribution of its political and economic resources. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Fanar And let us again give him a round of applause. If I understood well, if a, uh, Boko Haram is bombing and killing people in Nigeria uh, in the need to impose Sharia law, are we not going back to the Middle Ages when the church used cruises? Let me call upon um, Reverend uh, Dr. Adane Wood Mayan Michel. Nikaya. Yes. He is originally from Ethiopia. He is a transition priest from the Catholic Church. He is a second year student of PhD at Catholic University of Eastern Africa in the Faculty of Arts and the Social Science. In the Department of Religious Studies, he is Apostolic Vicariate. 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 Vicari
So he's going to give us the impact of religious antagonism on the communal life of the society in Kamata, Timbaro, and Halaba zones in Ethiopia. So let us give him a round of applause as we come. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Welcome for this presentation. Uh, my title already mentioned, I'm Father Adam Wolde Marian from Ethiopian Catholic Church. Uh, right now I'm studying in Catholic University of Southern Africa. So it's my pleasure to be here and to present this uh, presentation. My the impact of religious antagonism on the communal life and society in Kambata, Timbaru, in Alaba zones, Ethiopia. Religious antagonism has become increasingly relevant in political and academic, academic discourses because of the revival of religions. The contemporary world cannot be understood without accounting for the role of religion and religious organization in peace and conflict including the case of Ethiopia. Because nowadays you see the, using the religious term, many conflicts are happening in the world that the Ethiopia is not part of that suffering. Uh, they say that uh, this religious antagonism mostly rises because of the doctrinal issues and just treatments carried out against members of members. Uh, disagreement that occurs between the adherents of the same or different religious group for the incompatible religious interest because every, always the things come as a coverage, the religious interest to fulfill some hidden behind agendas to the, to the using the religious net. So this case said also claimed that intolerance of other religions and discrimination against members of the other religions, religious war, the intellectual conflict and conflict between church and state. Such conflict is a harmful to the overall credibility of religion and it may cause religious apart or disintegration among the society. It may rise in the attempt to religious convert tribal society and may result in ethnic disintegration and loss of cultural heritage. This religious that realizes, as you have said, the, the realized political ends behind of the religious conflict. There is a behind of religious conflict, political ends or political uh, idea. That political idea comes to use the religious end. So Mubumbi uh, also has said another, another uh, reason that brings the conflict is Mubumbi assess that the increased number of the, the independent creatures on still a new issue in the view of religious company. The views propagated by independent preachers have become an obstacle towards well-built relations between Christians. He also mentioned that some preachers use pulpits to preach political instead of feeding people with spiritual nourishment. Some preachers are, but to make money, not to serve, but to be serving. That is another kind of challenge in the religious life or in the communal life. Independent preachers use proactive propaganda instead of preaching the genuine word of God and allow people their freedom to make their own religious choice without compulsion. Muhumbi artists that independent preachers that they should rely more and more on the grace of God which over their intentions and actions instead of relying solely on their knowledge and skills, ability to only speak loudly and polished language and boldness to speak to whoever. In Africa, religion-based violence and extremism in ideology organized from the web now well many years back. For example, we are using Muslim conquest of North Africa in the 7th to 9th centuries, the jihadist campaign in West Africa in the 17th to 19th centuries. Example, 
Uliye, Uli Ani, best Chad and Uthman than Fabio for in the 16th century world from 1529 up to 1543 in Ethiopia, Somali border area led by Harari Somali, Ahmed Ibrahim Ali guys that is split to the highland in Tirol and almost destroyed the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia and it is religious infrastructure like church and monasteries. I will show you the picture how it has been to bring me this kind of challenge. These devastating episodes were motivated by call to supreme religious identity and authority of Islam, but always intermingled with interterritorial, economic, and political power motives, both expanding Christianity and Islamic conversions created a landscape of tension and competition between different ethnic and religious communities. Tanji stated that relation between Christian, Shawa Oromo, and Muslim Oromo, because when I'm saying using this word uh, from the northern side, Oromo, some Oromo people, the same side, right? they migrate to the southern side of Ethiopia in Oromo side. But those who came from the northern side, they are uh, Christians. Uh, and some are the, uh, from the native ones are Islam. So those who the native one, Looking at those who came with the same tribe, but from different side and the different religion, some are Islam, some are Muslim, Christians, those Christians are considered as alien for different outside countries. So that brings even a very big uh, open war among them, the same tribe of this different religions, Christian and Muslims. Background, the research area, this area research will be conducted in the Kaitopia. Uh, Kambata Timbaro zone, because Kambata and Timbaro Alawa zone initially the same zone, but later on they are divided two places. One, uh, Kambata Timbaro, and another became Alawa. So the Alawa changed its name, modified to Alawa, but to, uh, 2019 elevated the Alawa zone. So both Kambata and Timbaro Alawa zones are located south and nation, national top there. So I will be going to conduct this study in that area particularly because the most you know, some problem is coming in this area. I want to investigate. Will you take back? Okay, instead of the problem, religion touches upon the deepest level of identity. It can mobilize people for war, but also lasting peace. However, religion is a source of non-violent conflict, transformation, the defense of human rights, reconciliation, and social stability. But it has also contributed to the roots of violent conflict, intolerance, extremist violence in many parts of the World through exaggerate in many cases. Traditionally, religion in Africa has been an individual and collective source of meaning, hope, comfort, and deliverance. However, despite the high social relevance of religion in Africa and the avert intense religious city in, Afri in Africans, several hypotheses still connect religion to conflict in the continent. The religion policy of the current Ethiopia government is very different from any previous policy in terms of their religious freedom and provides. Because even we are saying about the democracy, sometimes democracy will bring us another challenge by misusing. We Africans mostly we are condemned by that misusing the democracy. Here, the paradox is why religious freedom and religious religious equality are guaranteed at the same at this time. While the tension and violent religious conflict 
in contemporary Ethiopia are increasing. Ethiopians interreligious relations have long been peaceful and tolerant. Because when you see Ethiopia at the first time when the Muhammad Muslim uh, Prophet Muhammad, he exiled Ethiopia, Ethiopia hosted him, accepted him. But nowadays, Ethiopia is fighting mostly Muslim and Christian. Some years back, the Muslim population number is very low, but nowadays it's become very high. When the number is coming high, the fighting, the child is also coming very much. So now, nowadays, Christian on other side, Muslim on other side, they are fighting in many places. However, in recent cases, interreligious conflict have been on the rise. In 2019, Muslim burned 10 churches in one day in the town of Alaba, which is where I'm going to conduct the study, causing much tension. But still, there is tension between religions. Even as, as recently as 2022, mosques in many parts of Ethiopia were burned by Christians, while churches were burned by Muslims. Sorry, the time is already out. You see, the problem is that this is the people who is burning the church Christians. They are burning the mosques. After burning, this is chatting, singing. After already the church is burned, no, the mosque burned it, but they are chatting. This is 10 churches at the same day burned by the Muslims against Christians. That is the way church religion now has become a challenge in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adani. Uh, let us Appreciate him with the hand of hands. Um, I'm sure that it was similar to what Father Paul was saying. Uh, these uh, Muslims burning, bombing, killing, and so forth. But a bit adding uh, to the Christians among themselves also start um, fighting within themselves. And in fact, uh, what we see towards the end of the crusades, uh, the Christians themselves also start fighting and they will come into the. So let me, uh, let me call upon um, Dr. Elizabeth Isingi, uh, is a sister. She holds, uh, she belongs to the Little Sisters of St. Francis. She just completed PhD on philosophy in religious studies at Ukwea. And she has published uh, books on leadership, professional coaching, and faith development for young adults and families. So let us welcome her. Good afternoon. And welcome to my presentation. It's very simple, in, and it's very, I have been helped by so many people who are presented here. Um, my objective to, okay. My topic is on coaching as a practical tool for peace building and conflict resolution. And um, all of us come from families, isn't it? And everybody wants to go back to a nice family where you'll be celebrated, you are happy, you are calm, you are cooked for well, and uh, you feel nice. And what all what we have been talking about. Um, 
uh, my my presentation assumes that a family is the foundations for democracies, for religion, economics, and politics. Uh, begin from family. We looked at we look at our parents the way they share power, the way they make decisions, the way they discriminate uh, between the children. We are angles fight about property and inheritance. So um, my argument is that uh, using professional coaching, which is a tool for facilitating individuals to think and uh, try to understand themselves very well, they come to understand their values, uh, we can be able to achieve good politics, good economy, good religion, and a peaceful environment for us all. So uh, my objective uh, is to appreciate the family potential for peace building and conflict, settling conflict, and then illustrate coaching model as a practical tool for facilitating the process. Um, coaching is just, uh, as I've, I've said, it's, it's a way, it's a tool, it's a self-help tool because the individual is able to take care of their, so, uh, to come up with solution to their problems by being asked meaningful questions to think and decide for themselves. And I've used it for seven years to solve family conflicts, religious conflicts between superiors and their juniors, and also family and marriage and some leaders, leadership teams. And it has worked. So I think it can be, it has been a very practical tool for me to help in sort, solving conflicts. And it can also be used in sorting our problems as you build them. Uh, that one you know. And, and you also know this one. <laughs> Only, the only person who has been able to make a family an agenda, at least to, to favor a family, is Father Paul. And I want to congratulate you because at least you have a connection from where you come from. Many people don't have any agenda in their lives about marriage and family. And so the problems that we are having, all of them, origins are the family battles. Because that's where we learn everything. We see everything how it is uh, organized. So, uh, this is how what characterizes our okay. We have families who are very peaceful, and it's not they are not just achieved it, they have worked very hard to bring their children together, tell them what is right and what is wrong. Some grow and change everything, but at least something remains, and they remain sensible to initiating or even managing and controlling, preventing conflicts. And other cases are sorry. We also have so many cases uh, today with those people who watch Kenya news. Uh, at least in every uh, news that is aired, maybe from nine or eight, there are two uh, 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 stories about killings, about murder, about homicide, a lot of stories about marriage and family, about people killing because of land, inheritance, if family can help us sort out those conflicts and if they are perpetuated by us, we go to the society and we behave the same because we have never been taught. Mm -hmm. the, this is now the current situation of the family. And the Bible also gives us examples of these stories, not something new. Uh, because the story of Joseph and his siblings, it was full of jealousy. And what, but the father of Jacob, the father of Joseph, I wonder whether he knew uh, segregating other children and loving this one so much, even though he was from a, a woman he loved so much, whether the future of the other brothers were really safe or not. Um, we look at Absalom. Uh, Absalom was revenging for the sister, Tama, because David refused or delayed to punish his brother Amon for sexually abusing. So when this injustice was not taken care of by David, Absalom took his power. And because David loved this man so much, he, begged, he allowed him to come back. And when he came back, he started pursuing his kingdom. He did not stop there. And then Solomon also did the same to the brother. We also looked at the story of the prodigal son. When, the, when he came back, 
The father really took care of him as if he was congratulating him for whatever he had done. And the brother became so jealous, and so a conflict was created. Uh, many people um, will, will talk about how to solve problems in politics, in, in, in economy, in what, but they will not have anything to do with the family, yet that is our foundation. Uh, possible uh, actors. We have women, children, we have uh, children are very powerful tools for building conflicts because first of all, they are very energetic, children and youth. And if without this, we can look at the world and how the young people have done a lot of damage. But if we, if we really use uh, children, we help children to train them to gain knowledge and skills about peace, right in the family, we will save the world. And the world will know at least a little bit of peace. They will not change all of them. Some will change, but others will not. Um, these are the actors, children, grandparents. Nowadays, they have become old fashioned and the liabilities, but before, and even in some countries like America, UK, they are very valuable because they do things that parents cannot do immediate in politics. So when, because they only, they also have their own traditional ways of uh, mediating conflicts, they also use those same skills and they also train young kids. If they are facilitated with the knowledge and skill through coaching, then they can be able to do much. This is a coaching model, which we use most of the time and it is called comprehensive coaching model. Uh, the, the, the one who has reported the conflict is helped to discover the story, to retell the story and remove the bias by, uh, by uh, repeating the story and being asked powerful questions to, about uh, the people who are involved in the conflict, how he feels about it and all that. Then he's able to refine that story, story to get facts and to separate facts from assumptions. Then they explore the conflict um, and, and they, we look at your, your identity and emotions and power. Sorry, help me to go back. Uh, we look at the, the power, the emotions and your identity and the way these three play in your life. Because if you believe that other people are, they, you are not succeeding because other people are cause of your problems, then you have also to make sure that you redefine yourself, you shake off and you improve on your personality, then you can be able to face conflict with a positive mind. And also how your emotions play in your personality and the power that you have to be able to move forward because the coaching philosophy believes that everybody has power when held or facilitated to think positively and remove bias, separate, to separate bias and assumptions from facts, then they can move forward to the next level. And then you craft the story and you enact the story by being given skills to negotiate. And to conclude uh, is that uh, peace building and conflict resolution is an inclusive idea, as in it's a, it's, a, it's a project which requires all of us and the foundations are the family. And you know very well what you've learned from your family, the good values you have received and how they help you now to jump into society and do good or do evil. Efforts, all efforts towards peace building and conflict uh, transformation begin in the family where life begins and find meaning and where relationships also find meaning, and then we can go to the world either with the same package or we can really examine the contents of our personalities, remove what is not working properly through coaching, and then we can be able to function well. Hmm. Our perception of the significance of peace also is formed in the family, and it can be changed when we are helped. And what is happening in the society and the world today is a real reflection of what is happening in our own families. You know, I've listened to people talk about what is happening in Russia, in Kerio Valley, in Kenya, in Marrakech, where children are in 
remote economies, but we are raising small puddings in our families. We have a lot of bombing bombs in our families. We have a lot of wrestling, but we are concerned so much on what is outside and yet inside the house, there is a lot of fire. Um, however, the family agenda is, is, is really ignored. Many people don't want to talk about family. It's like, I don't know where we come from. We, we better ask ourselves where we are coming from. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Oh, Reverend, Dr. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that, Doctor. Okay, no yes, I've finished everything waiting for graduation, but they are both pronounced. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, Sister Elizabeth, for your uh, presentation, uh, does it mean that? Uh, um, uh, violence, aggression begins from home, and that's why we have conflicts in the world. So our families are not yet well educated. If we say the West is more educated, what are we trying to say then? So thank you very much for that, and let us give a, a round of applause. So quickly, uh, let us try to be really. I want us to skip the part of questions but I think it will be not fair. So I ask the four presenters to come forward, at least one question each. And please just be, uh, go straight to the point. When you are answering, answer straight instead of giving the background. We have already the, the background of the whole presentation. So thank you very much. Um, please come forward. Um, yes, I think the microphone is here. Right. We can just use it from there. And, uh, 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 by Reverend Father Paul, Reverend uh, Dr. Dani, uh, Sister. Yes. As they come forward, I'll just go straight to my question. Uh, Christine, when you talk about gender quotas and affirmative action, what are your comments when it comes to, for the case of Kenya, we've met cases whereby people are awarded positions. Uh, Politician girlfriend and all of that, and they don't deliver. So, is it okay that we continue saying that we are uh, working on affirmative action when people are being given positions and they don't deliver on that gender bit? And then a question um, to Father Adani. Sorry, you from your presentation, you've not yet done the research, but it looks like you've already made a conclusion. The two regions are mainly the other side is Christian, and then Alaba is Muslim. But it seems you've already made a conclusion with the pictures and also part of the presentation talking about uh, what the Muslim community have done. So having the title as religious antagonism, to me it looks like more of uh, blaming that side. So the titles, you need to think already made a conclusion and the research has not been done. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question to the last two presenters, that is uh, Adele and Elizabeth. We want to, Reverend Adele, you talked about uh, us misusing our democracy. And you know, when you talk of democracy, I was thinking of rights and freedoms. And my right is like, it's my belonging, I have it. Maybe this is my court, for example. I have the right to use it, I have the right to misuse it, abuse it, disabuse. So are you telling us that we need to limit our right? And then the last one to uh, Reverend Elizabeth, who talked about family. The family institution has undergone several changes. Like, you must agree with me. There's so many people who have opted not even to go through that system of you know, marriage, you know, still so many single ladies. And the process of resolving those disputes have been given to the court, and the court doesn't look at peace. It look at you know how are we going to look at you know the reasons why you should divorce, and then the process of you know separation and even dividing that property. What's your comment about this? Yes, I have a question for Christine. Do you think that women could be the ones? Contributing for gender inequality or the problem of gender inequality, women themselves 
Do you see that they have a responsibility for that huge problem? Now to the two fathers who, who speak about uh, religion, and especially the one from the father from Ethiopia. This question of interreligious war has been there since the beginning of the world. I don't mean to say so. Do you think that the problem is not maybe people themselves who do not understand what religion is? When you speak about peacemaking, do you say we should not come back to the subject to speak like in philosophy to the being, if you want to use that word? Now to sister. My question is about witchcraft. Sister, we, we are in Africa. How do we solve? Do you think that those methods of talking to the psychologists, uh, I mean, the, the whole method you presented to us, can work if the question is uh, serious, like witchcraft? People eating grasses, walking naked, naked. With big stomachs, we saw that yesterday my sister's been and so. Okay, okay could you add my question? No, my question is do you think that the problem of interreligious uh, conflict is not maybe the problem of people themselves who do not understand what religion is? So instead of solving the problem only at the level of peace building with people. The only two things that we need to come back to the being, l'être même. If I want to speak in French, in case you understand it. Thank you. So we have the last question, please. Um, my question is to Christine. Uh, you highlighted some of the challenges to women participation in democracy. Uh, I'll give an example in Kenya whereby it is said that uh, women are their own enemy. So do you think this is a, is a real challenge or is it just a narrative? And if so, what can be done to address this challenge? If at all it's a challenge. Okay, thank you very much. Let me start from the first question. Uh, the first question was about uh, the what looks uh, not that the investigation is done. How do you look at that you said about the uh, way you see the pictures, many things? Okay, uh, according to the research uh, methodology or according to the research rule, to conduct one study, there must be a problem. If there is no a problem, you should not invest your time to research. So I, I found that there is a problem. Christian is burning Muslims area. Muslims is burning Christian area. That is a problem. That is the one that pushed me to do, to do my study or to conduct my study in that area. These pictures are taken from there. Since it is my own, uh, just few kilometers apart from my home, so that I know what happened. By then also, I was in the religious council in that area. As now at some points, how it happened. So now I want this to conduct in that area and to come out with recommendations and with a way forward what can, what can be better. So this is the one which I wanted to know because to start the work, there must be a problem. First, you have to realize some problem, and then why this problem is happening, you have to find out the, the sources and the way forward. Uh, for the second question about the, the misuse of democracy, uh, you see, yes, we have a democracy to speech, right of the speech, but we don't have a democracy right of to insult. So at the same time, when I'm insulting, I am attacking someone's person, someone's right. So I have a right to keep my keep uh, as I need my right to be kept. I have to keep others' right. So democracy does not mean fighting each other. Democracy does not mean attack each other. Because I have a right whatever I want to talk, it does not mean I have a right to attack someone's right. So I could understand the democracy that means. Because no other when you see many parts in many sides, when you see, even though I'm not yet I investigated through my studies, you can, uh, according to my hypothesis, there's a lot of challenges happening 
in, the, in Africa now by misusing of some parts of democracy. So we have, when we are asking our part, uh, we have to keep also our way, our, our rights. Uh, for the third one about uh, interreligious, this is not the way uh, the, the people might not be the only means for that conflict. Uh, okay, no, I can't say anything this is because I am going to do my study. After my result, after my investigation, the problem is there. And then I will come to my recommendations. The, my investigation or my study shows the problem is just this. For this, this is a solution. So right now, I can't give this is a problem, this is a problem, or the people, or some, because I put in some uh, previous studies or previous researchers' idea what they say that the religious, the religious just a coverage. Behind religion, there is hidden political agenda. Some uh, study shows that. So uh, that is their investigation. Let me find out my investigation, whether I agree or not agree. So in this point, I put, uh, right now, I can't say this, this, but some people asked, uh, asked uh, Jagete said, there is hidden agenda behind using the religious chair. That might be, I, mean, I, I, I will agree or not, I will see. Thank you very much. Uh, it seems that no particular question was actually addressed to me. <laughs> yet I take a lead from my brother Jovic's question that I made, made allusion to, to appreciate. So you spoke about interreligious wars as a problem of gap of understanding. Uh, interreligious wars, namely jihads and crusades we've seen in history, all hinge on the fact of misguided promises of some sort of eschatological rewards. For the Muslim, imagine the promise of seven virgins in the next world when you kill an infidel, just is it not perverse? But well, seems reasonable to a typical Muslim. For the Christian, who says, um, actually initiated by Pope Oban uh, in 1079, Oban II, uh, the promise of eschatological reward of going to war was invoked then. Simply because for, for the church, the Catholic Church, then uh, they were fighting the just cause of reclaiming the lost territories, our lost territories, and of course, waging wars against the barbarian attacks on Christians. Now, the final way to be said in all this is this the ongoing, uh, uh, there should be ongoing education because there are a lot of values and virtues to be appropriated in both religions towards making the, our world a better place. It's on this note that I want to say that what holds us together is greater than what should divide us. Thank you. Um, since we have been talking about democracy, I request to express my opinion about witchcraft uh, from the question of my brother. Uh, coaching is helps people to think and come up with facts and separate those facts. They are tested and they are proved to be true and the parties are involved and they are questioned. And so we separate assumption from bias, from doubts, from fears. So uh, I'm just wondering whether witchcraft can be proved. Who will test witchcraft and how can it be tested that this is a witch and this is what he's doing? And then if that is the truth, I don't think that there will be any problem with it today because witches will, will destroy all of us and the British all of us <laughs> I'm sorry, that is my thinking. Um, uh, about uh, what you are going to do with your family, issues, the cause and what. Um, when a, a case is presented to a coach, the coach helps that particular group to come up with a solution to their problems. And maybe even to go further, is like today's marriages are not really examined as the people are getting into marriage with different facts, with different expectations, some of which, which are not real, they are not realistic. And so they go test, they find that they are not compatible, they don't share the same values, 
whatever was taking them to marry does not work, and then conflicts begin because those people are not compatible. So if the marriage does not work, what are you going to do? I don't have an answer for that because everybody has the right to the solution to their own problem. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just be quick on the question Faith asked on whether gender quotas are working, considering a lot of uh, maybe would say favoritism that happens within. So I would say that I believe that gender quotas in itself is a good tool or it's, it's a positive tool that can be used to promote women participation. But on issues of corruption, these are always there. And because of this, this is why a tool that is effective can end up not being as effective as it should be. So I will try the question of Jovik and Jocelyn. Uh, uh, Jovik, you asked whether women, women in themselves are a problem. And I think this is a common phrase many of us have had. They say that women, are their own enemies. In my perspective, I believe women have numbers, but that support is not normally as much as it should be for their fellow women. So uh, as has been discussed today, they have talked about a lot of need for learning and unlearning, which is very important. And uh, a lot of education needs to be given, especially to women, to understand how important it is to have women who are able to represent them in decision making um, offices. Thank you very much. Um, I think we come to the end of this session. Um, let us give them a moment of applause. Thank you very much. As uh, we have seen this part, we are seeing the church um, Okay, uh, the religious believers fighting among themselves, fighting among uh, uh, with the others um, in the family, civil family uh, aggressions, conflicts uh, here and there. Yet we are trying to advocate on a, a specific political system that is suitable for Africa. Where are we then? Are we going to really get education for all families? How are we going to do, Doctor? When I would say. In the USA, you find these students who uh, go for studies and they keep, you know, owing to the state until they start working for 10, 15 years later. And our life span here in Africa is very short, maybe 40. And maybe I'm also living bonus. So where are we? Um, let us, uh, let me now uh, say thank you very much for calling with me during this period. I think uh, the pilot is now a bit tired, which the uh, compiler will take over from um, the plan. And I ask you, Mr. Um, Modesta Gamako, to take over the second part. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We are here from religious people too much. I actually want to want us to hear from a military perspective. We have a special person here who is a Brigadier General, Charles Uwebui. Sorry if I don't pronounce the name. Yeah, Charles is a retired chief chaplain army forces of Nigeria. He is a student at uh, IPSA. He holds masters in social anthropology, masters in philosophy, masters in pastoral counseling and spiritual care. He also, yeah, we have a lot, but this, this, this is enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to invite us here to present this topic, which is democracy and military intervention in Africa. About political stability. Please let us welcome Charles, our brigadier. While this is coming on, I and I was in the seminar because of the several accused that we had in my country from 1980 
1990, we had about eight queues. And in the seminary then, uh, we were told that those in the, those in the military, the only thing they learned is how to plan and execute queues. And it was everywhere in the academia. So we almost believed it, or we all believed it. But I, after my ordination, my bishop asked me to join the military. I joined, but one thing that made me to join was actually to go and find out how the human beings could just go to school to learn how to class you and the top development. So that has been a problem. I, uh, with my training, I went to Royal Military Academy in Southhurst. I did six months. I did another three months in West Point, that's in the US. I also did the chaplaincy course and for just in South Carolina. And nobody taught me how to do thank you. So I now discovered from all my interaction that there's no place in the world where military people are taught how to plan kids. Military people actually thought, you have seen my outline, military people actually thought how to contribute to stability. Because the constitutional mandate of every military person is to protect the territorial integrity of the country. That's the primary and fundamental mandate of every military. But in protecting the territorial integrity of every country, we also have this problem of a security dilemma. When a military man is empowered with a gun to protect the people, sometimes, unfortunately, he turns the gun on the people. Security dilemma. They are to secure the people, or rather than securing the people, the top of governments make the system uh, unstable. So then, what is the problem? We are going to look at the reasons for some of these. Uh, cues and causes, some intervention that have been done, and maybe see how we can prefer some recommendation because we don't have the time. In Africa, we have had about 200 cues since 1950. 1950 till now, 200 cues, more than 100 of them successful. The other ones we are not successful. And you will see with me here, Sudan comes at number one. Sudan took the first position. They have had 17 queues, six of which were successful. Burundi came second, 11 queues. Burkina Faso, Ghana, Sierra Leone they have had their own number of queues. And you Nigeria have had eight queues. So we wonder what has been happening. From 2017 alone till now, we have had 14 queues in Africa. I mean, in the whole world. And only one from outside Africa. That's 13 queues from uh, Africa. And now, why? What is the reason for this uh, use? We have had also, we might say we have different reasons. We might say international and domestic. Yes, we will always put them. Even when we deny that, we know that some multinational corporations and transnational corporations and collaborating with some of our leaders and also helping in ensuring that there's uh, instability in Nigeria, uh, in Africa. But some authors have come up with 
some reasons. The first is the superiority complex theory that holds that the military people feel sometimes that when they are superior, when they see themselves being superior to the government, that the tendency for them to take over. And how do, how do they feel as superior when the government is no longer legitimate, when the government is no longer delivering on their promises? So the military feels that they can take over. Looking at this, you see, in the military, actually, you will see two reasons. In all this, you see two reasons. The first is mentality. The second is disposition. In mentality, put competence also. Mentally, every military man or woman who have gone through all the trends feels that he's competent, feels he's equipped, feels he's better. That's why they are always in their own society. And when you feel that you are competent, and you now begin to discover that the one who is leading you does not even have anything to offer, the tendency for you to, to the tendency is for you to come and take over, particularly when you have the, the gun. The military people are like priests. Yes, priests study a lot. In fact, if one is to be a leader through studying, priests should be the leaders. And I think that's why one of the philosophers say that philosophers should be kings or should be leaders. So military people also study a lot. But in studying, they are given the impression that they are studying to be leaders from the first to the last. They are given the impression to be leaders. So mentality-wise, when things are not moving well, they want to come and put it right. And they cannot put it right by negotiation. They put it right by letting the guy who is there removing him from there. The second is uh, disposition. The disposition is brought about by the enabling environment that is created by the government of the day. So dependency theory. The dependency theory says all that some leaders in Africa partner so much with the military that they depend on them. And when you depend on them, and when the military knows that he is the be all and the end all, the tendency is for him to always call the shots, direct you on what to do, and if you don't do it, then there is a need to take over. But it is important for us to know that in taking over in the military, the military can never in a whole come and take over. There's always a section of the military that take over. Corporate positional or corporate resource grievances. Positional. Military want to be autonomous or quasi-autonomous because they study, they live in the barracks, they want to have everything on their own. They don't want, want anybody to come and interact or come and disturb them. So when that autonomy is not given to them, when things are not provided for them, when positions that are supposed to take are not given to them, the tendency is for them to begin to take over the government. There are also resource grievances. When the government of the day do not provide for them enough to take care of themselves, provide for their weapons and ammunition, the tendency also is for them to take over. But importantly, it is, we need to know that the military work with the government, with the civilians, with the politicians. No coup happens without the civilians or the politicians. In fact, I want to tell you that I was in Geneva during the vacation. We had some conferences at the United Nations headquarters and World Council of Churches. And the coup that happened in Burkina Faso was already known. It was just a negotiation that we were having to see. They were having to see. It was already known. It was just a question of time. So uh, politicians are actually part of it. Having said that, what 
what are we to do? What are we to do because of time? I've already been told that time is out. What is the way forward? The way forward for me, I'm recommending professionalism for the military. Train them. Because the military, as I said at the beginning, are always very competent, they are very agile, they are very active. When you keep them in the barracks without doing anything, without doing training, without doing exercises, it's then necessary for them to look for something to do. And they are, they are, they are, all the, the thing they are always looking to do is to be in charge because they were trained to be in charge. So let there be more training for the military and the more they go for training, you keep them busy, you keep them out of trouble and the, the place will be a little bit secure. Uh, finally, it is my recommendation, humble recommendation that because some of the African governments create a conducive environment for the military crews to take over, it is important that African government more diligently honor social contracts with the people, provide legitimacy to the governance, which should serve as the foundation for the oppositions in the state. The political class must guard against irresponsible actions including widespread theft of resources and constitutional cues. We have constitutional cues when the government of the day elongates their time, goes to change constitution, and the military man is there watching and knowing that these people have already, they have already carried out a queue. When a civilian government carries out a queue, the civilian government is encouraging the military to come and say, okay, you have already contravened the law, we need to remove you. So if the government of the day provides on their mandate, I think the military will want to be in the barracks. Because I want to conclude by saying that the military is safer, is better, always better with the civilian administration. The military is always better. So they pray for that. And when that is not forthcoming, they can't see that as it is go by. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brigadier. Uh, it's good to train military to be in charge. It's good to honor social contracts. Thank you very much. Once again, as I say, thanks for coming to our Brigadier. Okay, our next presenter is Dr. Estela Wangari Munjungi. Sorry, if I pronounce it not very well. Uh, she's a PhD student at Machapos University. She holds Masters of Arts in, in English Language Linguistic. She holds Bachelor of Arts Language and Literary. She's currently a tutorial fellow at Mount Kenya University, Department of Psychology, Language and Humanities. She's going to present on the topic of language education for democratic citizenship. She intends to present to explain how language teaching can integrate democratic citizenship into its, its structure, special education, is at the heart of my presentation today. Let us welcome Dr. Stein. Oh, sorry, she's. Um, um, I've been uh, following online and um, very grateful for the other presenters. I think we are. Uh, we, we've been um, enlightened a lot uh, about democracy. So my area, I hope you can see the screen, is on the communicative approach to language instruction so that we can improve the idea of democratic uh, citizenship in Kenya. 
So I begin by introducing uh, the idea of democratic citizenship. This is as defined by Osler 2005. So it captures the idea of uh, being a citizen, that is having a, a community to belong to, where one can exercise their political rights. Uh, in addition to having uh, the legal, being a, a, a legitimate citizen, you also have access uh, to the platforms for exercising your right to contribute to issues affecting you as a citizen. So this is in terms of uh, engagement in conversations and also decisions. Uh, so uh, the idea of this uh, study is to try to integrate uh, education with democratic citizenship, where we see that uh, uh, there's this uh, project by the European uh, Council where they try to justify uh, the inclusion of democratic citizenship in the education sphere. And they talk about three major competencies. There's the cognitive competencies, effective competencies, and also competencies linked to making choices and values, choices of values, sorry. So we're saying that we can integrate uh, language education with the idea of uh, democratic citizenship, where we try to teach our students how to make their voice heard so that uh, they can participate in public discourse that uh, discusses issues that are affecting them. And I think this will also help us when it comes to, for example, in our local Kenya scene where we have issues with the um, hate speech. If we try to integrate this type of language education where we, we train them on communicative competence, then they'll be able to uh, listen more effectively to maybe their colleagues who they are talking to or discussing with. They will be able to formulate arguments which perhaps do not uh, infringe onto the rights of the other people, like they, they, they don't get to attack them on the basis of their cultural differences or religious differences or even ethnic uh, basis. So this idea of this paper, it is a theoretical paper that is being proposed to help us to see how we can integrate these communicative competencies into language teaching and learning so that we nurture students who have these uh, dialogue skills that uh, help them to engage more effectively in, the, uh, in public discourse where they discuss about uh, issues. Maybe they, they are able to narrate the experiences challenges, especially the young adults or even children. When, when we integrate it with language teaching, we are going to perhaps uh, intervene uh, early enough so that when they become now prominent or when they get these political uh, platforms, then they'll be able to voice their views in ways that respect other people's opinions. And perhaps there'll be no Idea, the, the idea of hate speech will not be uh, something that we have to, to deal with. There will be no incitement because they understand the implications of their words. Uh, so there's a quote here by one of the scholars um, who states that uh, argumentation and debate uh, call for a knowledge of the subject and a discussion the capacity to listen and acknowledge other people's point of view, as well as uh, the application of this capacity to the precise situation in which people find themselves in. 
So in summary, this communication approach, this communicative approach will help us to try and see ways in which we can integrate uh, these competencies into language teaching so that we can come up with a, a student or young adults who are better versed to engage in the democratic discussions and other discourses. Um, thank you. This is as far as I have delved into this topic. I am still uh, ongoing with this with the with the PhD, so I am not yet a, a, a doctor. But thank you for the opportunity to present. And thank you very much. Thanks for setting our time. <laughs> yeah, so we still proceeding to call our next presenter, who will be Francis Aziza. Another one is very difficult for me to pronounce. <laughs> so Aziza is a, belongs to Jesuit com company, is from Nigeria. He holds the uh, degree in philosophy, library studies, and economics. He is currently uh, a final year student of theology at the Kima University. Let us welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so I'll be discussing on the topic of synergizing religion and democracy in Africa from a Catholic perspective. The middle name is Oga Nerukele, by the way. <laughs> Oga Nerukele. <laughs> All right. So I hope to do these two things at the end of this presentation. The first is to discuss the relationship between religion and democracy. The second is to show how the Catholic Church as a religious institution and contribute towards greater synergy between religion and democracy. If I'm able to do this in 10 minutes, I'll be happy. All right, so in general, I want to talk about religion and politics. Now, religion has and continues to shape African and global history and society. Over the course of time, we've seen how religion has been very important in world events. Now, previously, religion was peripheral to politics considered referral, but more recently is the importance of religion in politics is being felt and that awareness is growing. Now, Alexis Tocqueville in his book, Democracy in America in 1835, said that religion and politics are inseparable because every religion has some political inclination. Some more than others, but there's some political inclination in religion. Now, he also said that religion has both direct and indirect effects on politics. Direct effects as influencing laws and political opinions. It might interest you to know that some concepts used in governance and politics come from religion. Development, for example, in, in, integral development, for example, is a concept that the, church, the Catholic Church has been promoting and it has got in, into mainstream politics. So in terms of influencing laws, Religion is also very important. And then indirectly, religion has helped in shaping the attitudes, the beliefs, and the values of citizens of different countries. Now, there are divergent views on the relationship between religion and democracy. Now, the prevalence of democracy raises the question of the relationship. So as some presenters have already presented, we can see that there is some form of relationship between religion and politics, but the relationship is complex, very complex. And these are three different positions that have shown that. One says that religion is anti-democratic and incompatible with democracy. So for example, Richard Rothschild would say that 
monotheistic religions are undemocratic because if you are in a religion that only believes in one God, then there, there cannot be any plurality. There has to be just one God. So such a religion will be undemocratic or anti-democratic. The second one, people like Jacques Maritain, Tocqueville, and Antoine de saint Exupéry would say that religion is necessary for and is the mainstay of democracy. And then the third position is a much more nuanced view that takes both sides. So it says that some religions are more compatible with democracy than others. So people like Francis Fukuyama, Samuel Huntington, and Seymour Lipset would hold that view. But the important thing is that there's that divergent relationship between religion and democracy. Now, when we come to Africa, what do we discover? First, there is diversity and pluralism of religions in Africa. Even though Islam and Christianity are considered the main religions, but African traditional religion or religions, because almost every ethnic group has its own religion. So African traditional religions, Christianity, Islam, they coexist. And religion is part of the traditional modern African culture and society. It permeates all or most aspects of life, including politics for many people in Africa. You literally cannot separate most Africans from their religion. That's why Geoffrey Parinda and John Obiti will say Africans are notoriously religious. Just a, to put things in perspective, this map may not be totally accurate, but this gives you a sense that there is religious pluralism in Africa. So you have Islam, you have Christianity, you have Hinduism, native religions, and others. Now, breaking this down, traditional religion, Muslim, that's predominant now. So we have, in this one, the ones that are, are much more, a darker shades of red, uh, traditional religion. Islam, darker shades of green, and then Christianity, darker shades of purple. So, these are some religions in Africa. You can see the plurality or pluralism in religion. Now, I'd like to just highlight a few challenges to democracy that religion has brought about. And some of these have been highlighted very well in the previous presentations. Now, of course, intolerance. There are so many people who have brought up intolerance and discrimination amongst religions. Now, there's also the issue of politicizing religion. That is, in some states where a particular, the leaders want to make a particular religion, the state religion. There's also the issue of many religions requiring intellectual conformity. So you don't question the doctrines, you don't question what they say. So for example, they say, God said you should go and kill these people. No question, the act is being done. Now, there are also diverse views of different sects within a religion. Even if we are all Christians, we have our different ways of interpreting the Bible, and there are different sects of Christianity, of Islam, that have come from these different interpretations. Ideological differences among religions. The way we see God as Christians is different from the way Muslims see God, different from the way traditional people see God. And then there's the issue of quietism and escapism from world realities. In several religions, especially as they are practiced in Africa, there is always a tendency to look to the next life and to not try to deal with the issues coming up right now in the world. And then the separation between the sacred and secular. So there's that divide that people always think that as a religious person, you have to focus too much on the sacred, on God and leave each society there. So, what's the Catholic perspective on democracy? Now, Catholic social teaching has changed its appreciation of democracy over time. The popes previously, before Pope Pius XII, have held democracy at arm's length. But in 1944, in his Christmas address, Pius XII held democracy as best suited to protect people's dignities and liberty. Now, Huntington, one of the people we've seen previously, said the church, the Catholic Church, is the strongest institution 
in the latter part of the 20th century supporting democracy. And if we can read some of the encyclicals of John the 23rd, of Paul the Sixth, of John Paul the Second, and several Vatican II documents, you will see that they favor democracy, but they give conditions. They give very serious conditions. So in Saint Decimus Annus by John Paul II in 1991, he gave these four conditions. Citizens' participation, the government, the government can elect and hold leaders accountable, correct conception of the human person, and state's commitment to the common good. So these are four conditions he gave for supporting democracy. Now, how has the Catholic Church in Africa fared? Now, one important thing that has happened, and this comes from Vatican II, is the attitudinal change that has been occurring in the Catholic Church. It's an ongoing process, so it's not like we are there yet, but at least it's going on. So with these three documents, one on ecumenism, one on interreligious dialogue, and one on religious freedom, these have shown a desire to change the attitude of the Catholic Church towards democracy, towards democracy in terms of appreciating the pluralism in society, especially with religious freedom. That particular document helps people to understand that we have many religions and we should all accommodate, we should, we should all be accommodated with each other. Now, providing education through academic institutions, this came up with Afrique Munus, a synod that was done in 2009. Yes, and uh, it was, the document was from Benedict XVI. Now, communication media to the lightest citizens of their civic rights and duties, and encouraging civil participation through justice and peace commissions. So these are just a few highlights of some of the things that the Catholic Church has been doing to promote or to synergize more that relationship between religion and democracy. Now, final thing I'm going to talk about is some of the recommendations based on what the Catholic Church has done, some recommendations for further action from the Catholic Church itself and from other religions. Now, prayers for good democracy and governance in Africa, they are good, but they are not enough. We have to go further than just prayers. So religion should pay more attention to civic and political life of people and avoid escaping issues in society. Religion should also accept the full measure of democracy, including pluralism. We will always have many religions. So it's time for us to accept pluralism as part of our human experience. And with pluralism, what will help out is dialogue among religions so that we can find common values and work from there. And finally, it will be important for most studies to explore the effects of religious beliefs on democracy in Africa at the macro and micro levels. This is severely missing because you'll find such studies done in Europe, in America, and other places, but not very much in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aziza, for taking us through the Catholic perspective on democracy, especially freedom, equality, and participation, also the recommendation you mentioned. Thank you very much. The next presenter for this panel is uh, Mr. Tetos Wamai. Tetos Wamai is an uh, environmental lawyer with a master's degree in environmental. He is associate member of the uh, Institute of uh, Arbitrators. He is currently a student of masters in the peace studies and in international relations at IFSA. He is going to talk to present on democracy in a presidential election in Kenya. Let us welcome him again. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm just a bit worried that uh, our Nigerian brothers are taking over. But then I uh, thank God that this session we are two Kenyans here. But <laughs> now my presentation. I like to more times. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. 
So uh, as we look for the presentation, I think my presentation is just joke uh, memory in terms of, uh, I may not say it's academic really. <laughs> it's looking at why are we having presidential election petitions? And you see like even in Africa, I think more than 90% are not successful. So presidents also fail or also complain go to court, but of course don't nullify uh, those elections. So I've heard uh, from uh, different quarters, just recently in Kenya, we had elections, and we have heard from Raila say, we accept, but you don't agree. Sometimes I feel like there's uh, some kind of dishonesty in those statements, whether in terms of accepting or in terms of disagreeing, because how do you keep on accepting and disagreeing? We also heard from, uh, that was in 2017. You get it? Yes. In 2017, where I think it was the first time nullified in Kenya, I think it was in Africa. Okay. That's it. <laughs> so we. So I try to look at why we need to have elections, I think it's obvious, but also why we need to have election petitions. Uh, we know that elections uh, is a key tool, element of democracy or democratic governance. And we know globally that uh, choosing political leaders has to go through elections, you know, general elections like for Kenya every after five years. And we also know that political matters are also competitive. So there's a lot of contestations. So to, we have to invoke uh, judicial decisions uh, to arbitrate these matters. And therefore, courts cannot move away from dissolving conflicts or political conflicts. So you can see in terms of, that's an overview of presidential election petitions in Africa. Uh, Ghana is there, you can see Kenya, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and uh, Malawi. And I think uh, from, I, this should be from 1990s, uh, maybe some of us who are around myself and uh, Father Charles would say that uh, this was when a lot of what we say democratic governance or multi party system uh, came in, and then there was a lot of you know judicial decisions and people feeling like they can uh, seek for court redress in terms of uh, uh, petitioning these elections. But you can see also that in all these countries, none of those elections have been nullified except in the war in Ukraine, but also Kenya and Malawi. So Kenya was in 2017, in Malawi 2020. So the question is, why do people still go to court to petition the state elections? Uh, just to try to focus on Kenya, 1992, that's when we started now having these petitions, six petitions. I uh, was uh, about Orengo, Manyara. They were questioning or petitioning uh, Moise win election, uh, general elections, and all were dismissed. Uh, what the courts were saying on procedural matters, so technical matters, filing out of time, and all those things. And Matiba's case went ahead, but uh, there also were issues. We were saying by then it was required that Matiba was to sign the petition. He was incapacitated, so the wife signed for him, so that was dismissed. 1997, again, there was a challenge of uh, Mike Kibaki, Kijama Omano, and Raila in petition against the will of Moi, so that was also dismissed. The argument was that uh, physically you had to serve the petition to the, you know, the respondent. And it was difficult to go to state house to serve more uh, to come to court. 2013, uh, this was the famous Mutunga. It was also dismissed in terms of uh, the argument that the election would comply with the law. But strangely, in 2017, 
uh, which we are saying, I think in Africa and then the whole world, apart from Ukraine, Malawi, that was when the elections were nullified. And the reasons were irregularities and illegalities. So there's a lot of arguments about the process of elections and the outcome. 20, again, 2017, there was a fresh elections, but remember again, there was a challenge. There was a petition by Harun Wau, even after uh, the repeat elections. So you can see several of those, which means there was a lot of distrust or a lot of, you know, not being sure uh, about these contestations. 2022, very recently, eight cases. I think people have grown on the screen. I was telling my friends that are you sure even this was be nullified? Because we were saying, okay, maybe those who are from the other side were now saying it could be nullified. So it was never like there are the, the being being true or being uh, like aware of what would happen. And uh, so be it. It was not. It was uh, upheld. Uh, they are now having the nominees, meeting the nominees, and you will see that all the processes are going on, except even where the company is about, what Raila is now saying, maybe Raila and the Asmir or more, they are saying, we accept it, but we don't agree. So why presidential election petitions? Uh, I think I mentioned this, that all in terms of zero sum game again, where whoever wins, I think there was a discussion in the morning, that we assume that if this president then all the resources, country resources are for that side, a lot of ethnicity. We also think that the, the president controls it with the coercive power. I think we have had complaints in Kenya, the DCI, you know, the, the criminal investigation. I knew you uh, were in this. <laughs> then distrust of the administration of electoral process, processes. The arguments during the petition were how people perceive uh, IEBC, the Electoral and Boundaries Commission. A lack of universal public confidence, democratic institutional independence, where they were saying, okay, even the, the, now that the famous four that were saying we are not part of the process, so the process was okay. Ethnic identity, you've seen how these political parties are aligned to particular ethnic kingpins. So if you are in UDA and you come from Rift Valley, automatically you win elections. If you are in uh, Azimio La Umoja, and you're in Ukambani, Machakos, or you are in, in Nyanza, automatically, after the nominations, automatically, it's perceived that you win those elections. So factors affecting judicial resolution of presidential election disputes, this could be a bit legal, but uh, obviously there's a discussion looking at how these courts could be considering the decisions they make. So one, judicial history, they look at what would be the political consequences. So a lot of issues about political stability. But the question is, is it about political stability or justice? So if you are saying, you know, Kenyans went to vote and you have to uphold their decision of voting this and this, which don't have to look, we don't have to look at the factors that contribute to the outcome of the elections. So there are very key questions about either want to uh, uphold, want to believe in what we would call electoral processes, electoral outcome, or political stability. I'll move very fast. Then uh, there are people saying there are also advantages of these uh, petitions. So like res a resolution of these presidential elections, they form precedents. So they also form reform electoral processes. A presidential value of presidential election judgments contributes immensely in the resolution of all other electoral disputes. And you've seen in Kenya, in terms of development of the law, or even the constitution, but somehow, if some of you listen to those petitions or those arguments in court, you will hear mentioning that in the case of Maina Kiai and blah, 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 in the case of what happened in whatever this country, so we also think that it has been a process, at least to move our governance or democracy system, at least to some level. So not the way we were before 1990. Uh, there was this uh, quote from uh, Paul Mangi, or Dinga's lawyer, that those who keep criticizing the fact that Raila files petitions are the people who want to commit wrongs and hope that there is no accountability for them. What they want to do is to create an atmosphere of impunity where they are never held to account. The most important thing from this professor, Herman Manyara, Manyora, uh, also a political scientist from the uh, University of Nairobi, said the petitions have helped a change democracy in Kenya. Any of these things must be seen within the context of the struggle for democracy, human rights, 
and the overall good of the country. The little gains you have made over the years have been from things of, the, uh, of that nature. So when Majipa goes to court, Ibaki goes to court, you are trying to enhance and extend the frontiers of democracy. So we see there's some positive values or positive outcomes from these petitions. Some recommendations, I also mentioned that this is just to jog our mind or just to provoke us to think. I don't have a solution in this. I think there have been so many debates on how uh, others are saying maybe because of this political or judicial uh, review or judicial decisions, violence has gone down. Remember, we are saying, can you pull, can you relax? Okay? And we are not taking, the process has gone to court. So even those ones who are saying, no, we are not comfortable, uh, we are not sure that Ruto win, won, we are not sure that these votes came from Mukamban and all that, we say, okay, maybe we trust in the system, we trust in the judicial system. So at least it has helped. But just thinking around this, and uh, some of my recommendations would be maybe looking at what they also call from uh, the Supreme Court, uh, the fidelity to the Constitution and the elections laws. But how far does it go? Now that we have been having waiting for uh, uh, cabinet secretary nominees, and I've heard not one mentioning that the net value is below 100 million. So you can assume how <laughs> everyone is saying, I'm above 100 million, I'm 4 billion, there are questions around corruption. They are evading those questions. You would hear someone saying, no, it was a case because I was politically not correct. Equity and equality, somehow in Kenya, we have tried to move because of devolution. There are money going to counties directly to implement different activities or interventions. Somehow it has reduced that agitation or that, that anger that if one comes from a particular tribe or a particular ethnic group and is the president, then all of the other tribes, the ethnic groups will lose out. Uh, power sharing, uh, we have now seen that uh, there have been, there been quite alignments even before, just two or three days before elections, that we have one done from this particular another one. So it's not about ideologies, it's about the what I get from uh, if we win. And I think I don't want to, to mention names, there are even those who have been nominated for cabinet secretaries. And they, they just jumped ship from one political party to another the day before or a week before the elections. Uh, independent of government institutions, I think it's about also, you know, ethnicity, about corruption and all that. And enhance and corruption efforts, I think I've mentioned, a national cohesion. We have a, a commission on this, which is trying the best, but I think that we still have a lot to do in terms of addressing these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. We are on time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So the last presenter for this session is Teresa Karim. Teresa is a young, young lady. She has more interest in the promotion of gender equality, youth empowerment, she is a ambassador for peace projects titled Protection of Children and Youth from Sexual and Gender-Based Violence and Radicalization. She is currently undertaking a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology at the University of Nairobi. Let us welcome her. Is it afternoon or evening? Okay, no. uh, uh, my name is Teresia Karimi, as I have been introduced, but you say Teresa, um, Teresia. Anyway, thank you so much. We are going to have, for our case, uh, we are the youngest people in this room. Please don't start counting. We're going to have three people presenting. <laughs> I'm going to introduce the topic. Uh, my colleague will continue, and then you have the third person to continue. So I'm going to take two to three minutes. He's going to take four. The last one is going to take three minutes. So may I start? <laughs> Yeah, 
Thank you. Okay, our topic for today is democracy and the good governance. We all know that uh, democracy is a way of governing by the will of the people. Plus, uh, democracy is all about having a voice. And one thing I can say is that no system is perfect across the world. Uh, and democracy is an idea that is worth fighting for. And one thing that I asked myself is that, what is democracy in 21st century? Or what is democracy in today's world? Uh, democracy in today's world is ensuring that our democracy is having a strong voice to choose our leaders carefully and criticize positively where it's due. Uh, I go to good governance. Good governance refers to effective and efficient structures which provide optimal support to citizens in leading a safe and productive life in line with the desires and opportunities of the people. Uh, democracy and good governance, it's all about building open, responsive, and accountable institutions and processes that serve the needs and preferences of the public, which entails participation and inclusion. Uh, inclusion is very key in promotion of good governance by ensuring we all have relevant sectors on board in order to balance interests and focus on common goals. And when it comes to focusing on common goals, I'd like to talk about um, particularly reducing poverty and providing access for all and make sure that all administrative structures participate efficiently and they are always solution oriented. I'll go to what said by Kofi Annan, who is the former Secretary General, when he said that good governance is perhaps the single most important factor in eradicating poverty and promoting good governance. Fighting poverty and improving human development in Africa must begin with creation of wealth, a process that requires robust existence, a process that requires the existence of robust entrepreneurial class, sorry. And for our case, Africa has a long way to go. We have countries that they have not achieved such reforms that can prevent dictatorship, corruption, economic decline due to continued sectarian violence, weak and ineffective leadership, and lack of political will. For countries like, uh, I'll give an example of uh, Eritrea, Somalia, and South Sudan, they remain saddled by poor functioning governance. And lastly, the absence of good governance in many countries has been extremely damaging to the governance corrective intervention role, particularly in the maintenance of peace, and security, as well as promotion of economic growth and the creation of wealth needed to confront poverty and, human, and improve human development. Thank you. And I welcome Newton to be able to continue. Thank you very much. To state my name, my name is Newton to be a student from the University of Nairobi School of Law. And I just want to pick right from where she has left and try and project the issue for this event or afternoon about democracy and good governance. She has stated what democracy is and what good governance is. And I've been sitting here since the morning. And the whole conversation about democracy is about the people. And when you look at our constitution, Article 2, gives all sovereign powers to the people of Kenya. And I want to believe that it's equal to other nations. That means when we talk of democracy, we are talking about the people. So anything that you know we draw or we do, any administrative action, we do have in mind the people. So in this case, when we talk of good governance, we have to look at it in the lens of you know good governance. Said that can we have democracy, a good like can we have democracy and good governance at the same time? Or can there be an event where we have good governance but we don't have democracy? I think um, from my research or my statistics in different countries, you can find there are countries which just work so well, even without democracy, but you see they have good governance. Uh, I hope, as I know, we all know what good governance is. And you can still find other countries which has good governance, but they do not have democracy. But now, what is the case in Africa? That is the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning. In Africa, I hold the field which you may not hold, but that's my opinion. 
democracy and good governance were given birth to on the same day. And I want to believe they die on the same day. That means in Africa, when you remove democracy, you remove good governance. So in this case, what are some of the principles that we can talk about in good governance? Like that if we do not have them in our democracy, because democracy is directly expressed in our laws, directly expressed in our constitution, when you look at the content of the constitution, give about national values, and those national values are some of the principles which we need to know as part of good governance. When we talk about participation, public participation, uh, the other speaker was sitting there, talked about, you know, we are having laws which, you know, they have not been uh, scrutinized or they have not gone through public participation. I really don't think that is so because it is in our constitution that if you have any law, it must go through the public participation. Anything you do, any administrative action, it must go through public participation. I know you may have questions, and if I wish I had time, I could have dispensed one day. So we also talk of the rule of law as a key a principle when it comes to good governance. There is this thing or there is this conversation about rule of law. What is rule of law and how does it relate with good governance and how does it relate with democracy? And that's the question I'm going to respond right now. A rule of law is, you know, are we just going to have our leaders at the ballot box? And after the ballot box, there is nowhere you can find them. If uh, they step on you, if they break the law, there is nowhere you can find. I don't think that is so. That is, I'm speaking for our mother king. Like, for example, we've seen so many leaders, like the, so, uh, the very famous, um, right now, John Maluki, I think, uh, he has been convicted of corruption scandal. That talks of, you know, we have the rule of law. And there is the principle of ultra bias because of how students of public international law here, you must have a heart of ultra bias. Ultra bias is, you know, nobody is about the law. Even those leaders, even those leaders, even those leaders, they should all be by, by the rule of law. Quickly, I go to another principle, responsiveness. Responsiveness, how, how about responsiveness? Responsiveness is the ability of, you know, uh, our leaders uh, be in that capacity to respond the issues that are yet forth before, you know, uh, the citizens daily. And what are these issues? These issues are very common. We have social, economic, and ecological issues. Social issues, you know, them. ecological can be about climate change. Right now, even in the conversation that we had in the National Assembly, uh, in the setting of, I think we had the setting of an environment you know, we need today, there was a conversation about, you know, so many forests uh, uh, being uh, in the middle of, we are, we are, running, we are having really a, a problem with our environment. And I think when, when we talk of, you know, those issues, we need to get the right rules. We need to go back and look at what is right for our people. What principles should we adopt? And then if we adopt those principles, what is the effect? I think that is the conversation that we should have. But otherwise, democracy is a good thing. I want to conclude. I wish I had time, but because you know, time has always been a factor. Allow me to conclude we have this conversation another day. There is this monster called the Hydra of Lena. Hydra of Lena is a monster which had uh, was characterized with about uh, nine heads. And you know, the problem with this monster, when you kill or when you uh, behead one head, another head, uh, two heads will have to uh, retrieve. So, you know, this monster has a, a very, I don't know how to describe that effect, but I want to, to, you to have that image of how this monster looks like. Even if sand will kill you from a distance, it sand will kill you from a distance. So this hydro of Lena invaded our land back even at the colonial period. We thought we should have a, a independence, we got our independence. Uh, we, that is when we took off the first head. And then we again said we need uh, orthogonic solution. That is why we had the 2010 constitution. Again, we still have issues. So the hydro of Lena has still invaded our land and we should get ways of really attacking this monster. Thank you very much. Um, because of time, I'd say democracy has three main pillars, a strong institutions, informed citizenry, and good leadership. Informed citizenry is by far the most important thing in the pillars of democracy. And as citizens, we should have an understanding of our systems of government and actively engage in decision making in variety of ways. 
through your social media platforms, through forums such as this one. And without us, the citizens actively engaging in political society, then democracy can suffer. So um, normally in Africa and also from our country, Kenya, there is a sense of alienation among people. Citizens feel like they have no control over politics. They have no control over governance. And that's where, where we find democracy failing and we are not informed citizens when it comes to democracy. So therefore, as citizens, we should make it a decision that we take part in coercing our governments in order to deliver good governance, ensuring that democracy is taking part in it. Thank you very much. My name is Francisca Majala Moila, a student at the University of Nairobi. When I had a master's PhD, my stomach was boiling. <laughs> There's nothing to fear. Welcome to the world. We are wishing you to come, okay? We enjoy this world. Okay, thank you very much. I kindly invite all the presenters. I don't know which of you is coming to be here. Which of you? No, one of them, three of them. Please come, come in front here. Aziza, please. Uh, Estela, I hope you're still, you're still online. Yes, I'm still here. All right. So, kindly address one question to each presenter, please. Thank you so much, presenter. Uh, I have a question to each, except the online presenter. We we'll start with the uh, other chance. We talk about the military and the infrastructure. This is my question uh, for the judge. Do you think uh, when military take over power and rule because they think democracy has failed, people are crying for democracy? From the military point of view, as I asked, do you think from military point, do you, do you think the democracy will <laughs> To uh, religion and politics by Mr. Aziz. And democracy thrives where people believe in the philosophy of atheism that they smoke of. We have uh, uh, to the third presenter democracy and presidential election by Mr. Titus. My question is, when court upholds an election that people are crying for democracy, do you think from the point of view of the judicial system, do you think they, from their point that the feel is democracy? The people. No, the court system. And finally, to the our students from the University of Nairobi. The first presenter, yes, yeah. Can bad governance be associated with lack of democracy? Because the factors that facilitate bad governance was democracy previously. Can we associate bad governance with democracy? And finally, to the lawyer to be in the house. When court upholds election without democ democracy, are the lawyers happy that democracy prevails from court politicians? Oh, thank you. I go to Father Charles first. Um, I believe that one thing, one thing is to be a military man, and another thing is to be a politician. Um, and we presented so well that uh, military men, they feel a uh, superiority complex, and that's why they overthrow power. So uh, my question is, what is really the role of military 
when there is a instability in political system? Is it to overthrow? Is it to regulate? So that's my question to you. Then to Aziza, um, to what extent do you think religion can influence a, a political system? Look at what happened in, in, in Congo after the election. The Catholic Church sent uh, observers in different uh, voting polls, but what happened at the end, it was never considered. To what extent do you think uh, religion can influence um, a democratic system in Africa? Anyway, I have one question for these guys who presented. Thank you so much. I don't know your name. Uh, I, the, the problem I had with your topic is democracy and good governance. I was asking myself, is democracy not good governance? Is good governance not democracy? But I think you put it well. However, the problem I have there is that you said when you remove democracy, you have removed good governance in Africa. You mentioned it. Maybe when you were too fast, if that's not what you meant, you can say something else. So how do you answer people who presented in the morning because I remember in the morning I was in the same panel with at least two guys who were saying that democracy is not a, a good system for Africa because we have a traditional system of governance which I think also promotes good governance but not democracy. So how can you make a claim that when you remove democracy you have removed good governance in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. The last question I want to Yes, uh, I'm taking only 20 minutes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I have two questions. One, uh, any of you can answer. Uh, it is uh, since morning we have been with, uh, taking democracy as a blessing or you know, curse or uh, in, in middle. So my question is: What if we implement the concept of the democracy itself? fully in Africa, do you think all the problems will be solved? If we solve all the problems of the problems coming, the implementation of the democracy. So if democracy is well implemented in Africa, do you think all the problems we have been discussing uh, will be solved? Any, any of you can answer. Uh, the, my second question goes to Aziz. If I'm not uh, pronouncing well, uh, apologies. So, okay. A church appreciates freedom and equality at the same time, church and the democracy. So, how how uh, how, how 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 would you see democracy and the Catholic social teachings? And also, democracy before and then democracy today and the church today. How can, how can you see? Because when you talk of democracy, it's all about freedom, all about equality, and at the same time, Catholic Church is promoting democracy. So should we accept all the democracy tells us? Should we accept all the freedoms and equality that democracy uh, provides to us? For example, uh, in democratic country, uh, like homosexuality, LGBT, and LGBT is well accepted. Then when you say uh, church promotes democracy, should we accept as it is? So uh, kindly give me a clarification on democracy and the Catholic social. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Please kindly answer briefly, please, and direct the point. We can continue later in the corridor. So I hope there will be a brief answer to all these questions addressed to me. Anyway, the first one, to what extent do you think religion can influence political systems in Africa? That's Dominic's question. Okay. Someone asked the question here before, that can the democracy thrive where people believe there's no God? Yes, it can. Um, as long as they can share common values, they can agree on some values that they all share, including respect for the liberty and dignity of the human person. You don't have to be a Christian or Muslim to value the life of every other human being. And as long as they can commit themselves to a common good, then they can have a democratic society. So yes, 
Second question, to what extent do you think religion can influence political systems in Africa? To a very large extent, more indirect than direct. So in my presentation, I mentioned that indirect effects include attitudes, beliefs, and values. Now, if you are if you are an adherent of a particular religion, they are always teaching moral values, the way you should live and relate to other people. So for example, if we if every practicing Christian, every practicing Muslim, every practicing adherent of every particular religion followed the values, these values of honesty, of integrity of their religion, they will not have corruption. We will not have bad governance. We will not have many of these problems. Now, so to that extent, the church or their religions can influence. Now, directly, that might be tricky because sometimes it's hard. You do not expect the church as a body or Muslims as a body to go on the streets protesting. But as long as they can sensitize the conscience of their people, I think they'll be able to influence them and help them to live in a better democratic society. Now, the other question, how do you see the Catholic social teaching? So I also mentioned that in my presentation that the church, the Catholic church, I mean, the Catholic church is much more favorable to democracy from the time of Pope Pius XII, from 1944 onwards but with conditions. So it doesn't have a blanket acceptance that everything democracy throws at it, no. There are very specific principles that must be followed. And one of them is commitment to the common good. And another is the respect of the dignity of the human person. When you take some of these things out and you try to bring agendas that do not conform to these principles, then no that democracy would not be accepted by the Catholic Church. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, there was only one question from my good brother, but I wanted to throw it back, but what do you think? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's about um, if the courts are you know, ruling or upholding those elections, do they think that they're upholding democracy? That, that, that was the question. And I think I, think I mentioned that uh, even those you know, uh, losers, petitioners or either way, whoever uh, loses from the petition, we will hear these statements and I've heard from uh, 2017 when it was nullified uh, then even uh, 2022 from Waila that we accept but you don't agree. So it depends on also your perception. But then next second is the courts come in as arbitrators. They come in, resolve a dispute. That this one is contesting and the other one is contesting. Obviously, that one who loses will always say they did, you know, now the discussion is going around, but even the way the judgment was passed, that was the, not the working. That's not to be, you know, uh, wild goose, uh, whatever chase, you know, hot air. So I think it's a whole process. Uh, if you ask the courts, they will say uh, uphold democracy because they are saying this is the will of the people. And if you listen the way that they make the argument that can this more thing in terms of process of you know having the kids kids failing, like only in one part of Kakamega or some county, can it influence or affect the total number of votes? So in my opinion, it depends on your <laughs> interpretation. But I'm saying if it's the main institution for arbitration, then if you believe what my good friend was saying in the rule of law, and now that we are now okay with this because of the courts. I think that's the best way to say they can see themselves as a poly democracy. Thank you. She didn't have any question. I have about three questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll begin with the second and the last question. Short, because they relate. The second question was my view on when we remove good governance, we remove democracy. I began by saying, when, um, when we have good governance, that is, the good governance is kind of all the problems that we have, economic challenges, you know, the social issues that we're having, ecological problems. So we, 
we resolve those issues by putting them in the law because even democracy is found in the law we are in a country like kenya for example which we know if we don't put fundamentals in the law nobody is going to do anything about it implementation of democracy will it exempt good governance i think i'll I have responded that question to a large extent that if we implement democracy fully, that is, you know, everything is in our laws. If you happen to have had even in our countries, even the economy challenge is in our law, the issue is implementation. So if we implement the law, if we implement the law with implemented democracy, and that means even the good governance will be here with us. Somebody asked a question about upholding elections. Uh, without democracy, I think it should be upholding elections, maybe you intended to say without regard for the law. There is something that we don't understand, but because you've asked a legal issue, I'll have to respond it from a legal perspective. An election petition, the standard of proof is high. Like, you must prove it beyond a certain uh, standard. It's not like a civil matter, and that is what we don't agree mostly with. As Kenyans, it is not really that you have a petition. It's not because you have a, an evidence. There's a certain standard which you must upgrade. And then when you look at uh, our legal system, it provides ways or avenues for even appeal. Like, for example, if it was a governor issue, you can appeal to the Court of Appeal and then the Supreme Court. Now, there is this contentious issues about presidential election. When you look at even the international law, African Charter on Election and the uh, Election, African Charter of Election and Democratic Governance, you will find still that you can still go to even the UN and seek a legal opinion. But it, it, because I'm pushed on time, you will get me that I explained that. Thank you. Um, Tackling on the question of uh, can bad governance be associated with democracy? For me, I can say yes at some point, and it only occurs in instances of uh, political instability or where we have frequent changes in governing. Uh, we have the case study of uh, Burkina Faso, the groups that have been happening. Uh, we can talk of uh, South Sudan, where there is a political conflict, and it has really led to a lot of sexual violence among women. Uh, economy, in, in terms of economy, uh, South Sudan is very low. We can talk of uh, DRC Congo. Uh, gold was discovered there, and we expect uh, a lot of developments coming from there. But up to now, you can all agree with me that um, it's so low. Thank you, because of time. <laughs> I would like to start with the last question. But uh, uh, there will be no problem again in the perfect of our democracies. If we have the perfect democracy, there's even no problems are solved. Of course, no. Pro democracy is just one aspect of human interaction, human relationship, and human life. So there are so many other ones that democracy cannot handle. And uh, to add to that, I thought Father George this morning asked the question, what democracy is? Yeah, we have had a lot of uh, professors answer a bit. I don't think we've really gotten the right answer. I don't even have the right answer. But I think in Africa and everywhere in the world, democracy is negotiated. It's always negotiated. So I think Maybe we'll have to come to that later. But to go to the two questions, I think they're almost the same. The role of the military in an unstable government, and if the military, uh, if there is, if you promote democracy, of course, no. These two questions are one. Of course, no. Military coup is an operation. Even the military themselves know is a disconnect. It's not supposed to be. It's, it's an unnatural thing. 
soldiers are trained to protect. Not actually, yes, they are trained to lead, but they are trained to lead in sections, platoons, segments, battalions, brigade, companies, and the big commanders. The highest is the chief of army staff, not the president. So when a military man becomes the president of a country, it's an aberration. And when they go there, they try everything in their power to keep themselves there because they have tested it, it's sweet, and want to continue. But they know they're doing the wrong thing. So the uh, military, the, the role of the military in stable government is to, to collaborate with the civilian administration to ensure stability by constitutionally adhering to the protecting the territorial integrity of every country. So that's their role in stable government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please let us turn to our presenter. Thank you very much. So we have one point and a half. Okay. I will ask the user leader to come. But before that, I have a brief summary to show through images. Yes. Can you can you can you can you Okay. Our tradition is that once we have visitors, they have to go with something in their hands. We call it takeaway. From whatever we, we have done since morning up to now, this is the summary I can say to, to this image. This is the image of Bezos. You have seen the pieces are scattered and people are trying to put them together in the right place. Different colors, different size, and people you see, others are working together. Some are just quarreling, I don't know, but others are thinking what to do. Many people think that process is a game for kids or for children, but it's also a game for elders. It means a lot for me. This is the image I tried to give it to you today about democracy. From this image, it has different colors, different pieces, a different form, but at the end, what we succeed in doing is what we call democracy. With different idea, we can, with up to morning, from morning to now, this is the what we are, we, are, we are seeing. The second image is, we have seen it now, the beautiful of it, different color, different places, but each piece fits where it's supposed to be. So, collectively, all together, we see the pieces give an image of democracy. This is what I think. I'm not able to bring everything a summary from whatever our presenters, our moderators, and our participants said here. Please kindly go, go home with this image and yeah, practice what is democracy for whatever we learn from this session, this uh, conference today. Thank you very much. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Just a few minutes, I got a message from the principal that we have a new student team, Father George Macharia. So, Father, we thank you so much. <laughs> It's my pleasure to be here at the conclusion session of this eight student lead conference 
of a great institution, Ekima University College. One of the main purpose of this conference was to enhance understanding about the objective and themes of democracy in Africa, its promises and its challenges. Firstly, I would like to start by thanking the principal of this our institute, Father John, and the principal technician, Father Marcel Vineza, and the vice principal academics, Father Peter Knox, for permitting that we have a student-led conference this year. I thank the speakers for their excellent thought-provoking talks. I thank the organizers and animators of this conference, Father Emmanuel Boyer and his team. We thank you for your sessions and for keeping things both under control and relatively in time. Most importantly, I thank all the participants for their availability. Without your ideas, discussions, and inputs, this conference would have been not successful as it is. At the very end of this conference, I pray we will learn new ideas from each other, which I hope we will adopt them in our present day and in our future tasks as ministers and as pastoral agents. I'm fully aware that they are may be or will be insightful and useful presentations, which actually they were since the course of this conference, both in the plenary sessions and in the interactive sessions. I strongly believe that many good experiences were shared and good lessons learned. Many of us commented that a lot of good work has been done in the area of democracy in Africa but more needs to be done. Finally, I would like to thank all our staff who took the pain of organizing this event and ensuring it runs so smoothly. Dear friends, you have had a very, very long week coming here to listen to these presentations. I hope you are really tired. You may have your rest tomorrow, but we remember that on Friday, we still have another session where books will be presented. So may we not get tired, but come on that day still to enjoy and to listen very, very well. I'm sure you look forward to getting the rest of tomorrow. Thank you once again for your participation, and I wish you all a happy time to rest. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before a closing remark from the Dean of uh, Jesuit School of Theology, Dr. Marcel, I would like to request from those students from outside kindly after this session, you would like, like to have a picture with you together for our archive. Okay. So you're most welcome. And uh, sorry, we have a, a time for refreshment after that. Not good, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Tagambo, I did say. Dear Dr. Uh, Anthony Egan, my dear colleagues, doctors who are here, and faculty of the Jesuit School of Theology, and also in the Peace Studies and International Relations, our esteemed guests from other universities and very brilliantly presenting their university here, students at Hekima, and all of you colleagues, good evening. In the spirit of, uh, of truth and excellence towards justice and service, the motto of our university, I think this day really fits very well with that motto. A search for truth, for excellence, a desire for justice, and all this is geared towards service. 
this could not have been such a better day. The Kima certainly has served on this particular day of student-led conference, has served as a lighthouse. If you have ever been in the sea and you see a lighthouse, you know it indicates, it gives you direction, but actually a lighthouse doesn't attract to itself. It should lead you to somewhere. So this particular day is a lighthouse to further destinations ahead. If I may invite you in the Ignatian spirit to do just not one repetition, to do even the second one and the third. For those who are not Jesuits or who don't know the Ignatian tradition, when you finish a prayer or a day, you want to review the day and, do it and, and, and see what has been useful. And even within the spiritual exercise, you do the, the prayer, and then you repeat. And the second repetition is to come back to those, to those important points that you think will may be helpful for the future. So as we end this day, let me invite you to, to do a repetition at the end of the day. What do you take away? On this student-led, certainly student-led conference, we have fostered the idea that we are committed to a search for excellence and truth, breadth and volume of research, and this is geared toward, towards making a difference in the community in which we live, the very reason of existence of the university. Listening to your presentations, the questions you raise and the answers you give and the unanswered questions, we thank God that you have all put the Ignatian tradition of Jesuit education at the heart of your search. Your critical analysis of the issues that affect our people, especially the challenge of democracy in Africa, is clearly one of the Jesuit educational characteristics, critical analysis. Your discourse was not simply a deconstruction of what is there, but a desire to affirm the goodness that is in the human person, but also the realization that we are not there yet. Things are not as they should be. You have marked the sense of wonder and mystery at the heart of Jesuit tradition. It was also clear, at least to me, that your ears, at least for some of you here studying at Hekima, that your ears at Hekima University College are assisting you in the total formation of each individual within the human community. Your presentations were a clear sign of your desire to develop yourself to the fullest capacity, intellectually, imaginatively, affectively, creatively, and you have done this for many of you with great communicative skills. We could not be happier. I think we can give ourselves a round of applause. I think this not to exclude those who came from other universities, the same applies. At the heart of Jesuit education is the individual care and concern for each person, what we call pura personalis and the promotion of dialogue between faith and culture. In your future work and ministry, you'll be called to realize that life is more than black and white. There are gray areas of people's lives for which we don't have answers yet. Take care of each person in their context. And we hope that Hekima University College is equipping us with those tools for intellectual, cultural, social, democratic, and communal growth centered on responsibility within the community. At the heart of Jesuit education. A person who has gone through Jesuit education or those who have visited a Jesuit institution like ours should not be satisfied with a mere minimum. I think those that I teach will know that. At Hekima, we are not satisfied with doing the mere minimum or just attending classes. You should always search for more, the magis. In fact, the more you study, the more you realize that you know very little. 
those who have studied more actually are more humble. Studies within the Ignatian tradition are not meant for personal self-aggrandizement. Whatever you are is a gift. And whatever you have received so far must be given away. And indeed, one of my esteemed professors at Boston College, uh, uh, Michael Haim, says the mark of a Jesuit education is that whatever you have received, you must give away. So go and give away. Whatever you keep, you lose, Jesus would say. So do not study simply to succeed, but rather study in order to add value and to make an impact in people's lives. That's really the meaning of success. I would like to sincerely thank so many of you who have been here, not only those who presented papers, but those who participated actively, but in a special way to our students and professors who have presented their papers, in addition to their ordinary work. I think we really owe them a debt of gratitude. Please join me as my hands cannot clap along. Thank you very much. You went extra mile, especially when you have some professors who give a lot of work. So you do have gone very much ahead. So in a special way, we thank you. Giving a lot of work, we don't do it with any regrets. We are not here for vacation. So we want to thank you in a very special way. And thanking the Dean of the School of, of, of Peace Studies and International Relations, Dr. Here, everything went smoothly under his leadership. So, Dr. Elise Tagamba, thank you very much. This would not have also been possible without the leadership of Dr. Emmanuel Boy, who has led the students through this whole process and communicating with them. I'm not sure that he's still around, but in his absence, please join me as we thank him. There have been several others, uh, especially within the Center for, uh, for Research, Training, and Publication. To each of you, there are, I will mention this, and I will mention Dr. Elias Obongo, Dr. E e Egan. I will face Changalat, and so many of you have been here behind this, this student today. In a special way, I want to thank the person who did the poster for this day. I think it was very creative and beautifully. I stood up with someone outside there, I think. This poster speaks for itself. It doesn't have a lot of words. You can look at it, and you want to come to this conference. I don't know who did it. But please thank me, thank him with me. We want to thank you in a special way. This is a Wednesday, but we still have another day of the week, of the research week, Friday. And it will be filled with uh, some wonderful uh, speeches from uh, one of the professors, uh, Dr. Mary. Mary Kitui, who teaches at the Catholic University, but also has taught here at Boston at, 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 at Hikima for several years. So we look forward to her speech, especially within the topic of synodality, contextual theology, and peace building. Please welcome and welcome others. This will be on Friday in the afternoon. Communication is part of our culture. You will get communication to that effect. As I conclude, please remember, as T.S. Eliot says, only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far they still can go. Thank you very much, and may God continue to bless you and continue to bless your work. And as though to those who have come from other universities, go and tell your colleagues and your friends that there is another lighthouse there, and we wish you to come and to come back. Thank you very much. I was asked to conclude with a 
with a word of prayer. It's uh, to great joy. I am a priest, so I can, I'm happy to do that uh, with great joy. May I invite you to stand and together. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, in the spirit of the founder of the Society of Jesus, through which whom we also have got to get this institution for Kekima, we want to thank you. He has invited us not to see studies as unending themselves, but as a means to saving you and to helping souls. We thank you for this particular day and pray for all our students and faculty and all those who have come from outside Hekima University that you bless us and you bless them. May you continue to sharpen our mind and our vision as we look to the future and that whatever we do, it may not be for us but for your greater glory and the integral development of your people. For this we pray and we offer this in the hands of our mother Mary in this month of October, as we say. Hail Mary. And may what we have learned, we go and give away. The Lord be with you. And May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. We have some refreshments here. So this is just in the corridor. That's what it's said. But kindly come for the photo session. Students,
Okay. I'm on Thank <laughs> you. 